Hello, future millionaires, and welcome back to the Get Rich Slow podcast. I am your co-host, Adrian Shermer, joined by my fellow co-host, Robert Delavan. Hey, Rob. Good morning. And today we are going to dig into uh, part three of this little saga on the home buying process. And uh, last time we, we left off, we had just done the inspection. We were already under contract. Um, obviously, we cleared the pre-approval hurdle um, earlier down the road. Uh, and, you know, at this time, uh, your loan in the back end on my side is going to be entering um, a number of processes after contract while your inspection is happening. Um, if there were any missing documents, as we discussed, a uh, loan officer or their assistant is going to reach out to you and ask for updated pay stubs, bank statements, all that kind of good stuff. Um, proof that your earnest money has cleared your account, which we also um, kind of went over a bit, setting some of that money aside. Um, in a protected fund that title keeps control of so that it is um, protected from from being taken. Um, it's it's being held by a third party is what I should say, not protected from being taken. There's not a, sure. a new, bunch of new, uh, earnest money. Neutral, keys out there. Yeah, neutral, a neutral party. party. Right. right. Um, and, you know, again, that's really just there so that if you just say, hey, I don't want to buy this house anymore just because, which is insane, um, but it happens, uh, then you're out that money because you've helped, you've made the seller pull their, their property off the market. Um, uh, otherwise, if you have a fan financing failure, if the house gets appraised and there's an issue um, and you can't come to terms, something like that, then the earnest money is typically released back. Um, I, I don't think I've ever had, yeah, I've literally never had a seller lose their earnest money, honestly, but um a lot of companies too, uh, mine included, now offer protections against that um, okay. just in case. Uh, but it's fairly rare. You really, you know, again, you have to kind of like raise your hand and say, hey, I don't want to buy this just because. Right. Um, so let's dig into that though. Um, appraisal. Appraisal is really where I want to kick this off as we had been talking about, Rob. Um, and uh, obviously we've been through a number of them. Um, and you have the good fortune of being on the seller side a number of times too. As a lender, I'm right. pretty much exclusively buyer side representation. Um, and though though I may talk to a seller once in a while or a seller's agent uh, to kind of keep good communication, um, ultimately, uh, I'm usually on the, the buying side. So right. um, what is an appraisal? Yes. An appraisal so, is an enormous report. And, and it is a requirement for lending. Uh, the, it is Almost the process... All in which the property, in addition to the, uh, well, the appraisal, the, the appraisal is the process which, which, the, which allows the property to qualify for financing. It is the independent third party licensed bonded insured appraiser is going giving their opinion of value at a given point and basically saying that this property is, uh, checks all of the boxes or not to uh, be a good uh, credit risk for the bank and frankly then, or, or the lender. Um, and ultimately the, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and um, the back end uh, mortgage backed securities uh, investments. Yeah. So it's a standardized form. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's considered, <laughs> if you ask an appraiser, they will say, this is a science, it's not an art. Although you ask a long time appraiser and they're gonna say, yeah, it's actually science and art together. Yep. Uh, but it is a report that takes usually six other comparable properties with like, uh, like qualifications or, or similarities and then adjusts for any differences, square footage, location, um, condition, uh, good, fair, poor, you know, excellent, so on. Uh, and uh, makes those adjustments, you know, two car garage versus one car garage versus three car garage versus four bedrooms, three bedrooms, mm -hmm. all of those different things. With and regional with regional adjustments, sub adjustments on those as well. A three exactly. car garage in the middle of a metro downtown area is way, way more valuable, of course, um, right. than somewhere where, you know, you've got just land aplenty and it's, it's no exactly. big deal. Um, yeah. so I, Iowa has waiting. different adjustments for, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or, or I should, I could, you know, I don't want to pick on Iowa. Right. Um, let's just say the suburbs, <laughs> a three car garage, you yep. know, a third bay in our Portland Metro market is generally worth between 20 and $30,000. Yeah. So a third oh, that's a good point garage. too. The way you say third too, uh, right. the second garage is worth a certain amount. Exactly. The third is a, a larger amount because it's an unusual 
Um, so there's a, like, there's a rarity factor in some of these exactly. features as well. Um, right. A view is a factor, uh, ocean front, lake front, mm -hmm. um, all Mountains, of these things get, get you know. factored in. Corner lot, um, whether you're next to a major road, the noise, uh, a train that runs through, all these things in theory are going to be factored into the appraisal. Um, but you mentioned it, Rob, one of the key things is that they're going to use six different properties. Right. Um, and so uh, that's where we're talking science and art, I guess, is the way we're going to describe this. Um, there is a science to it, and it's a pretty strict one. Um, they, they are generally supposed to use the most recent sales. Typically, these are all going to be sales within the last three months. Um, they're going to be less than a mile away. Um, you know, if a, an if appraiser doesn't have to, they're not going to stretch out their radius um, because the accuracy is really dependent on, um, you know, uh, it's like that old saying, wrong side of the train tracks. Literally, that can have, obviously, it has a difference in real right. estate values, um, the neighborhood, the schools. Um, this page, this is a, a, you know, what, usually 30-page report. It's pretty expansive. Um, and while there are portions of it that are boilerplate, it's um, it's a it's not an easy job, I would say, because uh, there's a lot of data that you have to crunch. Um, and they use software to do this now. But, you know, um, as an appraiser, you got to go out, take pictures. There's different appraisal levels as well. An mm -hmm. FHA appraisal is more involved and, an, and a VA appraisal is more involved than a conventional appraisal. Right. Um, and then one more layer there actually are. And these are. Not super common in, in at least my experience, maybe some other folks are getting more, um, you know, we're all kind of skewed by our own demographic that we end up working with, but um, there are appraisal waivers, even on purchases. Yes. Um, yes. Right now, typically it's going to be at least a 20% down situation. It's going to be um, a, a property that was either recently built or recently appraised as well, mm -hmm. something that they've got system data on. Um, we're probably going to see the return of what they call drive-by appraisals, mm -hmm. where you do have a human being kind of just cruising by literally, um, or just making a walk through the house more to just make sure that the place hasn't burned down or ripped a hole in the roof or something like that. Sure. Um, but we're going to see more and more of this electronic valuation. Uh, I'm, I'm positive of it. That's my prediction right. anyway. Right. Um, but it's fairly rare because a lot of people don't put the necessary down payment in. Um, and I will, I'm going to step in front of a, a potential myth that I could see forming. Um, your mortgage company doesn't really have the power to determine whether or not you're going to get that waiver. Um, that's determined by, uh, and I might chew into this more in a different episode, but by an electronic system. Mm -hmm. um, they're called DU and LP. Uh, they're, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have electronic systems to underwrite loans. Um, and that's why, I don't know, there's kind of an interesting thing there where different lenders actually do often have to follow the exact same lending guidelines and rules. Um, so uh, that system, though, can give a waiver. If it does, we're allowed to use it. If it doesn't, we're not allowed to question <laughs> the robot. Right. Um, right. It determines, uh, you know, it's, it's based off an algorithm, really, is the, is the, the core of that so that, right. so that it remains subjective, so that it remains, you know, um, or to remove the subjectivity from it. Right, independent, third party, all yep. of that. Yep. So, the or, the appraisal is ordered um, depending on what type of appraisal, what type of property, what type of loan, all of these different things. Uh, it's generally, historically, it's always been ordered after the inspection period is complete because people want to back out uh, in an inspection period. They found huge issues, or you know, couldn't tackle certain things, or couldn't come to terms sure. on. Uh, now you've got an eight hundred dollar uh, appraisal or, report for a property that exactly. you definitely weren't going to buy after you got that inspection. Right. So. Um, with that said, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but depending on the market, uh, you might have to for quicker closes for competitive properties, yeah. different reasons. You oftentimes have to actually order the appraisal basically on day one of the purchase. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually due to competitive reasons. But at the end of the day, what you're looking at is, uh, okay, there's your $800 appraisal. Uh, I hope you really like this house because you don't want to sink $800 yep. appraisal fees on five different properties that you back out of during the inspection period. Exactly. Uh, that could get expensive really quick. And you'd want but, to confirm this with your lender. But typically, you know, for example, we've had um, certain specific market conditions where appraisals got even up into the four, five, six week. Um, this mm -hmm. was insane when there was huge, huge volume pumping through um, turn times. So we would order appraisals day one contract hits. We'd order it. 
if the inspection failed out, and this is lender dependent, but I've I've worked for a few different lenders where this has been the policy. If the appraiser doesn't actually go out, um, they're not going to charge you the full amount. They're going right. to they're going to charge you some sort of like booking fee, uh, 100 hundred and hundred fifty bucks, something like that. Right. Um, they're going to keep, and then they're going to recoup rec uh, return the rest to you because because um, hey, they didn't actually do the job, but you know you you locked up their time in theory. Right. So that's that's the piece where you know it's case by case, and we'd we'd work with uh, each individual client on that, and you know lender and realtor work close together on that side of things to make sure that we're not you know spending the buyer's money before they're even getting into the house. But yep. um, the idea is the appraisal has been ordered. Uh, it, it they go out usually within sometimes a couple days, depending on volume in the market. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it takes a few weeks, but. Um, they go out, they appraise the property. Everything looks good. It's financeable. Uh, there's no holes in the walls. There's no uh, yep. They're going to take pictures of everything. Make sure the house is up to code. Space. <laughs> right. One of the big code ones for us here is the um, the strapping on the water heaters. Yes. that have double that strapping for an earthquake. Um, Smoke alarms. Used to not be a thing. So there were lots of properties that didn't have it done yet. Yep. Um, and then once they get sold, you know, um, that's, a, that's one thing about buying and selling a house right i mean it, you kind of have that you're you're now exposed to the new code you know you can right. get grandfathered into stuff but when you go to sell now you got to make sure that you're up right. to whatever the county says is acceptable safety standards right same thing with smoke alarms uh, that gets called out a lot Big because they're Big not one. you know in every spot that they're supposed to be bedrooms and and so on um oftentimes that gets called out so the appraisal comes in and there's a few different scenarios. The, the typical scenario is, let's say it was a $600,000 purchase. Mm -hmm. Lending was for you know $525,000, whatever it was, 75K down, uh, which is pretty typical in our market uh, for a uh, you know, move up home or even some high end entry level homes, uh, depending on what area. And uh, it comes in and it was $601,432. That was the, what the math worked out. Okay, we're in contract at 600. Everything's good. Everything was signed off. There's uh, all the issues are taken care of. And we proceed to final underwriting and review and close. Yep. Uh, great. Okay, no problem. Great. That's typically the way it goes. Yep. Uh, uh, or above value is exactly. 95 plus percent of transactions. Scenario number two would be, oh, it's way above value. Well, great. Guess what, Mr. or Ms. Buyer? Uh, all right. It came in at 625. Right. You got a good deal. Still and that's your information. Thing. Seller does right. not get to know this unless you tell them. Exactly. Uh, the appraiser is not going to tell them. Um, right. And when we have that happen, we just let them know, yep, it appraised at value. Good to go. And we got a great deal. And we pat ourselves on the back and everybody moves yeah. forward. And uh, we look really closely at, hey, refi to get rid of that mortgage insurance if you mm -hmm. didn't prepay. Mm -hmm. um, or whatever the case may be. So every, you know, everybody is a winner on the buyer side. Yep. Uh, the third scenario would be it comes in low. Yep. This and is an appraisal shortfall. Exactly. And the, basically what the appraiser is saying as the representative of the lender on the back end, the investor really is who they're representing, uh, is saying for whatever reason, uh, and there's a myriad of reasons, but the purchase price, the contract price is higher than the comparable properties uh, that have sold within all of the rules, uh, location, um, area, condition, all that sort of thing, uh, is less than uh, what the contract price is. So yeah. let's say it's and the, 10, and the report will explain why. I mean, these are I, right. I love appraisals. Um, that's a goofy thing to say, but they are they're just excellent data sets. They, it's right. very clear and concise. Um, there's a lot of data, though. I don't know if concise is the right word, but um, it will explain in detail why that property isn't worth what right. maybe you were trying to buy it for. Right. So let's say again, the contract was 600,000 and the appraisal comes in at 590, uh, in the state of Oregon and in most states, to my understanding, uh, there is a contingency, um, having to do with financing that says if the appraisal comes in low, then or or the property you know the condition isn't there then all parties have the option to either walk away um, with full refund of earnest money or to renegotiate yes and the renegotiating part is always fun um, on the buyer's side when i'm representing a buyer 
uh, I always look at it as appraisal shortfall as an opportunity to get my buyer a better deal. So let's say it appraises short 10K. We go, hey, sorry, wasn't worth it. Here's the 10K. You know, you need to lower your price from 600 to five, 590. Yeah. $1,000 win for the client, right? Absolutely. Um, it's generally not that simple, no. but that's the start of the conversation. Especially in a hot market where people exactly. are playing, paying exactly. over. Um, and there may be justifications there. And there's some things where people are going to feel like there is some sort of undefinable, right? That, that the appraiser right. couldn't have found that value. Right. Um, and one of the big questions that we get always, every time there's a shortfall, right? People go, um, well, the appraiser must be wrong. Sure. Um, I have successfully proven an appraiser wrong. We did so last year. Yeah, we got we a on total a of a thousand bucks out of it because you got to remember, you've got six properties that they're using as an example. So if you come up with a reason that you think they're off by a thousand bucks on one of those properties, that's only one six of a thousand bucks that you can really make up difference there. You've got to find some pretty big gaps or you've got to find a reason why the appraiser really missed their mark. Right. Not to say that that doesn't happen and not to say that I haven't had much bigger ones. And I definitely have had some five figure um, ones, but it's pretty unusual to flip these things. Right. Um, so that's usually not the strategy we take unless the seller really digs in and says, Hey, um, you know, I want to copy this report right. more often than not. We do give a copy of the report when there is the shortfall like that. Cause they want, sure. they want to see that proof. You know, you're saying something like, Hey, I want $10,000 off this property. <laughs> Um, and from the lending side, I just want to go real quick. Um, I'm going to flip your example a little bit, Rob. I'm going to do a 60,000 down, which would be 10%, okay. right? 10% is a, is a milestone. Um, if you put 9% down, you're going to be in a different financing term. It's going to be more right. like you had put 5% down. So there's these kind of buckets that we end right. up in. That's why people end up rounding off to those numbers. So right. if you had a $600,000 purchase, you're putting 10% down, that's $60,000. But if you have an appraisal shortfall, and the property is now worth 590000 even if you're still going to purchase it for six hundred, dollars that's the agreement you make. The seller says, I'm mm -hmm. not going to budge. You got to buy it as it is. If you want to have 10% down, that 10% down is now only 59000 but that 10000 is 100% your responsibility. So right. now your down payment is technically in the, in the terms of what the technical term of down payment means, 59000 but you have to make up the gap of the shortfall, which is 10,000, which right. means you are now paying 69,000 plus closing costs instead right. of 60,000 plus closing costs. So that right. $10,000 shortfall, um, you know, the rough math of it is that you're going to pay 90% of uh, the, the gap on top of your down yeah. payment once right. you run all that math all the way through. Right. Um, but the long and short is that it's actually, yes, it's exactly... Um, the difference. And then now your, your percentages are all shifted. Um, or you may at that time, I've had people who, who end up in that situation. They might go, okay, let's go down to 5% down so that we don't sure. get slammed by that. And I'll just accept the negative consequences to my mortgage insurance rate and to my, my total payment. Right. Um, and that's where some creative lending can come in. Right. And, and fortunately, you know, we've been able to do that. Um, a couple scenarios, the one scenario we talked about last year where we got it adjusted a thousand dollars, I believe the original, <laughs> the original shortfall was $19,000 and we were able to get it adjusted from 19,000 to 18,000 yep. because we said, Hey, uh, comp number five is not as good as this comp up the street. You should have used this one instead of that one. And the okay. appraiser, you know, doing, being a human being, right being questioned on what they're an expert in said, fine, we'll swap this one in, but I'm going to make these adjustments. And, um, you know, it's, it's 18,000. Now here's the beauty of it. When we're representing a buyer, which is generally where Adrian and I are working together, mm -hmm. um, for a buyer, uh, we say, great. Okay. Um, it came in $18,000 short in that particular instance, there was not a backup offer. We were not competing. And the seller said, oh man, and they pay, they, they dropped the price by $18,000. They weren't happy with it, but they did. Yeah. And let's so, take them aside there real quick. Cause I, this is a flex for you, Robin. I want to explain those listening might go, okay, why Robin, Adrian, why did you go to bat for the seller? Why would you try to argue that the house is worth more right. money? It's a show of faith. Uh, right. Sometimes we do these um, somewhat futile efforts and that might sound like we just gave a thousand dollars away, but it was a sign of good faith to the seller. And I feel like in that transaction, I know that they were balking at that price and they were saying, hey, this doesn't seem right. We went to bat. 
we successfully struck and we didn't get a lot, but we got something. And that, right. you know, that inch got us the mile that let them right. say, okay, they fought this. They really put in, we even tried to pull extra comps and stuff. The effort was made. Um, and it does turn out that yes, this house is worth less money than we thought it would. And it, I think it helped them accept that, you know, right. we at least met them not halfway, but we met them no. a little bit down the road, a, a few steps, right. at least in the journey. Um, and that was, you know, that's part of our, our job is to find right. what is really, you know, you don't want people walking away feeling like they got screwed every time they're on the opposite right. end of a transaction. That's and it was a sweet business. hinge point and it started just from a, you know, little negotiation nerdiness, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was, Hey, these guys are stretching to buy this house. It's not competitive because the condition was fine, but not great. Um, lots of DIY, that sort of thing, which makes mm -hmm. a house uh, less attractive. Um, and at the end of the day, we went back, Oh, the appraisal came out 19,000 short to the seller. And the seller said, Oh, well, that's terrible. Um, and we said, by the way, from the get go, we told you that this buyer was, basically stretching to the point where they could actually get into this home. They do not have extra cash period. Yes. This is, they're spending every dollar for their down payment and for their closing costs. So when it came in short and we went through that good faith effort and we got a thousand dollars out of, you know, 19 went to 18. Um, and we illustrated that effort and it took a week to do that with the seller, the seller's going, Oh, you know, but I really got to sell this house. So they said, okay, fine. Um, we know the buyer, or at least they, they, they felt that the buyer couldn't make up the difference. And the situation was such that the buyer wasn't, wouldn't have been able to do it. It would have failed. And so we had communicated that. So we negotiated a better deal for a client, yep. um, on the selling side, on the listing side, uh, of course, we're going to do everything we possibly can almost to the point of if, if we were actually representing that client, we probably would have, um, said, you know what, we're going to go back on market. $18,000 is a big difference. Yeah. Uh, but that client, you know, wasn't at the point where they could do that. Uh, we happened to know that they were buying a home on the other side. So it was one of those things that they made a decision that uh, in a, in a vacuum, they probably would have said, no, yeah. I'm not going to take an $18,000 yeah. concession, but it was best for them because they had a purchase on the other end. One of the options at that point would have been, okay, go reapply with another lender. Let's extend by another three weeks and let's go get another appraisal. Yeah, um, it's a rare expensive. one. expensive. I've been on both ends of that process and right. it's very difficult to get a different value. It, it is. Um, but, you know, if, if it's that much uh, and everybody wants to hang and try and the buyer wants to get another appraisal, yeah. um, another $800, uh, then so be it, you know? Um, so there's, there's a number of different ways to go. Um, but this brings us to kind of the next point is an appraiser, even though there's a science to it, there's standard changes, like we said, you know, third car garage versus second, you know, two car right. garage, that sort of thing. Um, per the area, they have all these standards. Um, this is where the human element comes in, right? So we stage for when, when we're listing a home, we stage for buyers, right? Uh, make it look awesome uh, little hint um, when people actually live in the home it never looks like that <laughs> yeah so yeah. it's one of those things where we're going oh, mine doesn't okay yeah it, it doesn't look like that all the time but people buy on hope that their life will look like that and it looks like that mm -hmm. one hour before everybody shows up for Thanksgiving dinner and then everybody shows up and you know their kids and grandkids and everything else tear it apart yeah, but, that's why virtual staging is becoming so popular right now, too, because you there. can create that austere, clean look. Um, there's some ethical implications there, too, because sure. they can be done very poorly. Um, but, you know, uh, buyer beware, obviously read the fine print and be aware that some pictures online are virtually uh, largely staging, right. fabricational. Yeah. And they may not even make like geometric spent sense. I've definitely seen pictures where it looked like right. they fit a king bed with room to spare. And then you stand in that room and you're just like, this is a closet. Right. But what, what happens is that appraiser is going to walk into the house. Mm -hmm. We want that house to be serene, to be picture perfect, to be everything yeah. that it was. That's a common question, possible. right? Should I bake some right. cookies or something? And like, do I need to impress the appraiser? An right. appraiser will say, no, we are absolutely, you know, so we, we remove the subjectivity of this process. Exactly. It's, it's a, it's a robotic, Objective you know, we're going to ignore exactly. uh, the pile of trash in the corner or whatever it is. Um, right. Reality. They're still human beings. And you yeah. know what? You walk into a place and it smells like dog turds 
or you, you know, Which like actually does it affect value. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, or does you walk in, it's fresh, it's clean, maybe cookies, maybe, you, you know, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be, you definitely want to put the best foot forward for the, for the uh, uh, appraiser. What ends up happening is even though it's all objective categories and certain adjustments that the math has already done, uh, there still is things such as like excellent condition, good condition, fair, poor, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. Well, the difference between, you know, fair and poor might be a nice stage shop. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, so, so different things like that. So, yeah. and if I can't see it, your carpets, then I can't right. make a fair assessment of what condition they're in, but I'll there probably make an assumption. It, exactly. So, you know, if there's a bunch of junk. <laughs> yeah, um, no, so, I, I mean, I've done hoarder homes. Uh, it actually, can get as bad as I had one where um, financing was denied because uh, this was on a refinance. They said, this is a fire hazard. We don't want to lend on this property because there's just so much stuff here. Someone's going to die if it lights up. So um, we don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Um, so yeah, cleanliness is a factor. I'm not going to say it's going to make or break. I don't think it's a swing your value $10,000 sure. by any stretch, but um, you know, it's nice to have the rosy glasses on when they get into the house. Exactly. So um, the goal then is that it's comes in at value or your licensed broker will use it one way or the other, a hinge point um, to your benefit. Yep. And we'll fight like hell to bring it up if we're the listing side and on the buyer side, we will, uh, you know, use it to negotiate. Oh, sorry. Your house isn't worth what we thought it was. And, and there you go. Yep. Um, there is a couple of key points there too, Rob. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we touch on, cause we did talk about the strapping and the, the meters, but I want to hear, um, your side as well. Uh, there's a lot of patch stuff that is sometimes done before appraisals. That's a great mm -hmm. idea. Let's say you had a leak, for example, you fixed sure. the leak, but you still got the spot on the ceiling. Right now the appraiser can't assume that that's an old leak. So they don't right. know, and they're not going to take your word for it. Um, little stuff like that, uh, chipping paint on the outside is also mm -hmm. another one. Um, we've had, uh, um, uh, one of my, uh, one of the neat ones I think is kind of clever is that if you have like, uh, sometimes you'll have a patch of floor or an entire room of a floor where it's mm -hmm. all, um, uh, what's that flat wood. Oh my God. I'm having a brain fart. You know, um, it's just subfloor. It's just oh, oh, uh, right, right, right. particle yeah, board or whatever. Particle board, whatever um, it is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that is not uh, a floor covering, but if you paint it even, that right. is considered a type of floor covering. It might right. not be pretty, but at least it's passable. So sometimes there is that, that's where having a good um, real estate agent can be uh, a positive factor if they've got a relationship with a handyman and they can get a little bit of work done. Rob, I know you use, you guys have your own general contractor in house because right. of how big of a deal this is. Right. Um, but there are little tweaks that you can make. Um, if you're had got an electrical panel and that, um, you know, the, the plug socket and that mm -hmm. cover got smashed, someone, you know, bumped into it on accident. Right. Um, that's technically exposed wires that has right. to be covered. Um, right. And if that gets called out, you're wasting the buyer's uh, money because they got to pay on 150 bucks usually or so to have the right. appraiser come back out and take a look and make sure that was done. Um, and you're also just, you're not giving your house, you know, for what are they, 87 cents at the hardware store? Right. Um, right. So do a sweep, you know, right. look at your house as though you were an appraiser. If we can give you advice from the selling side or from the right. refinancing side, um, those are the things that we just see snag people up. Sometimes it's just like, man, you could have, you know, you got the, the plug dangling out of your fire, uh, right. smoke detector, you know, right. we can tell you yank the battery out of there and I know why you did it, but just put it back in, you know, right. for this moment, at least so that we can make sure that, um, it looks right. I had one recently, they had shut the hot water off to the house because they charge you, even if you don't use the gas, they charge you to be hooked up. Um, yeah. these folks had just moved out, um, and the agent didn't, you know, make sure this is one of these double checks you should do before you clear a house for sale is make sure because the appraiser had to check and make sure that there was running water. Cause that's a code right. thing. There has to be running hot water. How can you test the appliances and everything if you don't um, have that? And they will right. test the appliances. Yeah. And they'll, uh, it's, it's really, you'd think it's common sense, but there's so many times that we see either, you know, the real estate broker wasn't there, never was at the property or yeah. was just, you know, casual in that they just didn't look around. Um, so there's, there's a lot of pieces there, a lot of pitfalls. A lot of balls you want somebody there. who's engaged, looking mm -hmm. at it from an appraisal standpoint. At the end of the day, the vast majority of transactions are not cash. 
Um, they are, uh, you know, going through the lending process and the yes. appraisal is a huge, huge pivot point. It's also a huge opportunity from a negotiation standpoint, um, listing okay. side, buyer side, you know, all of those things. Uh, and frankly, there's a number of hoops to jump through when it comes to that. So uh, you just you just have to have the savvy to uh, see the pitfalls ahead of time, you know, an ounce of prevention, you know, a pound of cure, um, so on and so forth. All of our grandparents are, uh, you know, celebrating because we listened apparently. Absolutely. We Absolutely. Um, uh, so just, just being ahead of the game. Is, and then the other piece of this, the appraiser can also call out repairs beyond uh, we're talking about some pretty light stuff but mm -hmm. uh, my favorite extreme for some reason is always the hole in the roof because it's just funny to me um although it's not funny if it happens to you it can be a, a serious and a compounding problem um water is one of the most dangerous things the value of a house um you know electrical obviously you can have a fire but um water will destroy things on uh i mean if you've never been through an event like that or or you know had a house um, have something, I mean, my mother's washer went out. She ended up getting an entirely new kitchen because it ruined yeah. the base of all of the cabinets when it spilled right. out into that space. Floors, um, subfloors have to be replaced. Um, there's a lot of things that are made of wood that you can't, you just can't undo right. the damage that water does in a pretty short amount of time. And a, a lot of times this stuff happens when someone's not home. Um, that's why I'm a big proponent of some of these more new technologies for 10, 20 bucks, you can get a Wi-Fi based sensor that will alarm you if uh, if water hits the, the the ground, you put it under and, your water and heater. Shut and, and, and shut the water down. And shut the water down. off too. Yeah. So, but um, if we have one of things. these repairs mm -hmm. called out by the appraiser, that is a financing contingency. And remember, appraisal comp management companies, um, although they are sometimes owned by the same parent entity, they are separate companies, um, and they, are, they don't work for the lender. They are right. contracted by the lender to do this as a third party, similar to how right. title operates. Right. Um, we want that separation. That's a deliberate design within the lending process to, again, remove that bias. You know, If I want to keep my lender happy because I don't want them to book me again, then I'm going to want to give them the value they want. That's not a good thing for this process. We right. want um, that, that subjective view. Um, so let's talk about that. Rob, You know, the appraisal comes back. I'm going to shoot you that text. Hey, man. We got value, but they say the roof needs to be replaced. That's right. a big dollar item. Yeah, it's and it's a big deal. And at that point, uh, it's again, it's a hinge point depending on who you're representing. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, if we're representing the buyer, we say, great. Um, we're going to squeeze Guess what? more value out of you're the You're getting seller. a new roof. You're getting a new roof. Or at least, you know, some serious repairs. Um we're going to get certifications. We're going to get different things. Um, it just it just depends on the situation, but there is uh, it becomes a hinge point of uh, the buyer is going to get some additional value. Now they yeah. didn't necessarily know that the roof was was completely shot, but you know it's uh, that the lender won't won't approve it because the appraiser called it out. So we've had situations where the on on the listing side where the buyer actually or the or the appraiser I'm sorry. Uh, said, oh, well, we need, we need uh, a roofing cert and it has to be signed off by an engineer or by the local uh, government. And uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, it looks like it was replaced. It needs to have at least three years. years left on it or something, it, exactly. for example, as one of these. You know, or they want to see the permits. Um, I mean, uh -huh. we've had weird situations where, oh, it looks like a new roof. Where was the permit for it? Well, most general contractors, licensed, bonded, insured, if it's an existing roof and they're tearing it off and putting a new one on, they're not going to get a permit for it because they no. don't need to. No. Um, the local municipality doesn't require it. Uh, we've had weird situations where a appraiser actually called it out, therefore, said it was a new roof, therefore an underwriter then said, oh, well, we need a permit. Obviously that underwriter didn't really know housing very well, but you know that became a problem. So there's a number of things like that, but the bottom line is, is when these things pop up, we're going to use them to the advantage of the client as much as possible um, on the buyer side or on the seller side, we're going to mitigate them as much as possible by getting expert opinions, um, getting bids on what it would cost to uh, make it last, say, you know, say a roof to last five more years versus replacing the whole thing. Yeah. And of course, yeah. you know, I'm and some say, repairs just have to be done. Sometimes right. that's just it. That roof is done. There is no right. patch job available. 
Um, and as you can imagine, replacing a roof takes a long time. So what mm -hmm. happens then? What if, um, what if we do need a new roof? Uh, some of these repairs, if they're smaller, do have to get completed before closing. Um, this is one of, well, I would say one of the more common reasons that, that closing might be pushed. Mm -hmm. um, one in five closes uh, happen beyond the original contract date. And this is part of that because this kind of negotiation comes up and then we have to move the ball. Um, so I always tell people, you know, you don't have the house until you got the keys in your hand. Don't get too right. in love with that close date um, until especially the appraisals, really one of those big milestones, I feel like that, that can cause a shift. Um, so it's kind of a sigh of relief sometimes when we get past that, if we've got underwriting decision, um, you know, and it's minor, minor stuff and we have an appraisal that's clean, um, we're the odds of this thing closing on time and, and closing it all go up astronomically. Those are a couple of the, the more, you know, those are where issues crop up. So that's why we try to get it done as early as possible right. too. So go ahead and hire movers. At that so, yeah. At that point, you know, you should be good. Right. Um, if it's going to be something that's going to take longer, there also is, um, and I'm not going to go too deep into this because different lenders have different rules on this, but mm -hmm. there is a seller holdback as well. And so right. what that means is if the roof costs $10,000, Typically, maybe twelve and a half to fifteen thousand dollars is going to be held of the money that they would have gotten at closing. They'll mm -hmm. still get all the rest of their money, and then this will sit in an escrow account that's held by the lender, um, and then they will directly pay the contractor who has made the bid for ten thousand um, dollars. And let's say there's a bit of spillover, as often happens. That's why they hold more money. Um, right. It actually ends up costing eleven thousand because they yanked off the shingles and found out they had to redo some of those boards. Um, then. Uh, not a big deal. Um, right. Once it's done, the contractor gets paid after the uh, appraiser, you know, time is booked and everything for that revisit to, to mm -hmm. make sure that it's confirmed is done. A licensed bonded contractor can't be, you know, your uncle Larry's going to do the roof for you. Nope, right. not going to fly. Even if he's bonded, he's related. Um, usually it's got to be someone who's a separate entity like that. Definitely right. not going to be the person who bought the house. Uh, and then the remainder that 4,000 bucks would go back to the seller. So the seller would get that money, um, at the end, um, or that can sometimes go to the buyer. It just depends on how right. it's negotiated, but, uh, there are options, you know, that doesn't have to be a deal killer or that doesn't have to necessarily mean that you can't get the house. You could get the house and the roof could be done week two that you're in there. Right. So, um, to it finish up, it can be a windfall actually it can be, it, it, it can exactly. be a good thing. We've seen it be a win for people a number yeah. of times. So, Absolutely. um, don't let your heart sink too much if that occurs, just, you know, let it play out. Yeah. Um, keep your wits about you. Right. Um, and then, so the final piece, then let's say the appraisal appraisal goes through one way or the other, mm -hmm. any repairs that are required or have been negotiated and are done or getting done and you're in final underwriting approval and yep. uh, the last few yeah. steps of this. Yeah. So underwriting is a multi-step process. Uh, as we've talked about pre-approval, there should be some underwriting in there. If you've got a good mm -hmm. loan officer, um, uh, unless you've got a super, super simple financial situation, um, which happens often. I mean, there's times that I don't have to, you know, run through a pre-underwrite um, because I know that we're going to be safe. Um, right. Then we will have uh, an initial underwriter review. So the underwriter actually takes that electronic version that I was talking about um, and they use that rule set. Um, you can look up these rules, by the way, you want to look up the FHA rules. The handbook is over a thousand pages. It's public knowledge. It's online. You can download the PDF. Just Google search it right now. Um, oh, it's a fun, light read. Um, <laughs> it's uh, no, it's awful, but um, it, you know, it's, it's thick, it's super thick. And uh, that's the point of these electronic systems is to, to narrow it down to your scenario and, and get the conditions that we need. So you'll get a conditional approval. And one of those conditions will be an appraisal. Um, and then there might be other ones on there. And depending on what they are, you know, this can be a a multi-layered discovery process. And I've had some people say they feel like they're under trial. Um, you are under trial. You are borrowing six figures. This is a pretty serious deal. Right. Um, this is not a, you know, a discover card with a $10,000 limit. That's not that much money compared to this. Um, and people always ask me, you know, like, hey, but they're going to get the house, right? So like, what's the big deal? If the house is worth this much money and I'm putting five, 10% down, they can definitely sell it for that much money. That's the thing. Uh, foreclosure is awful for everybody involved. Right. On average, foreclosure costs the bank over $70,000. Um, right. They lose money on every single foreclosure. There's no such thing as a profitable foreclosure. I've never even seen or heard of one. I had friends that worked in foreclosure. Um, it's bad press for the bank. Um, it's, it's just not a pathway. It's just not a real right. option. They want you to pay on your loan. They want to make sure that you can pay on your loan. And they want to make sure that they follow all the rules because as a lender, we're going to sell that debt. It's going to get wrapped up in mortgage-backed securities and get sold. And if we don't fit in that box, 
that's going to take up a parking space on our lot. I'm going to use the car lot analogy. So I can sell less cars now because I just had that spot blocked off until that person refinances, right. pays this loan off, whatever it is, or it's going to shrink. And then maybe I'll get a little more room. So the ideal years. to keep that machine yeah. moving. Right. Banks don't want homes. They want loans that yes. are being paid in service. They do not want a portfolio <laughs> of homes, period. Uh, it's just more profitable for them as a business model. So, so every time you send something in, there's a possibility that we're going to ask for another thing because of that. Just be right. ready for this. Sometimes this bounce back and forth is literally 15 touch points. I've had that happen. Yeah. Other times it's been one and done. We're just waiting for the appraisal. And the appraisal comes in and those are sweet. Right. They feel good. We, we make every attempt. There's no win for us in having to keep coming back to you for conditions. Right. Um, nobody likes doing that. And I'm just going to throw out there. If you have an, uh, a loan officer who asks you for something that they've already asked you, you've already sent in, just remember it could be a technical problem. Maybe the upload didn't complete properly. Um, you might've been missing something. I've had people send mm -hmm. me something repeatedly, yell at me. And then I finally say, Hey, go ahead and open that file. It's blank. There's nothing in there because the scanner didn't work. Right. Um, you know, so make sure that you're looking at your files before you send them. Um, I've right. also gotten page one, three, five. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. miss the back because the scanner doesn't scan the back. Um, right. There's a bunch of little things that can just waste tons of time. Just communicate with the people that you're working with. Make sure that you keep open lines. Right. Um, ideally, your loan officer, their job is to, to chase after you for this stuff. Um, uh, but you don't want to slip through the cracks and then it doesn't matter whose fault it is. You're not closing on time. That just sucks. Exactly. So be aware during the process, be responsive, be ready to provide these things pretty rapidly. Um, and then, yeah, so we have initial conditional approval because you've got conditions, right? right? We need the right. appraisal. We need this. We need that from title. A lot of the conditions are going to be stuff that comes from third parties too. Um, we talked about getting a homeowner's insurance policy, get right. your quote really, really early in the process. That's something right. that can slow you down. Right. We just had someone denied for a homeowner's insurance policy for a real crazy reason. So um, just get that done nice and early. Do your shopping right. nice and early for some of that stuff. Right. Start checking those boxes off uh, as quickly as you can. Um, and then if the appraisal comes in, we have final underwriting approval. The underwriter is really saying, hats off to you. You are clear. We're going to give title to go ahead. There's going to be right. a balancing process where we make sure all the money makes sense there. Right. Um, every penny all the way to penny, right. And you know, that'd be earnest money and, uh, lending expense and, uh, commissions mm -hmm. and what well, you might be paying uh, for the rate. I'm not going right. to talk about locking in rate right now. Cause it's an entire right. conversation yes. But in that process. You are going to lock your interest rate typically right. for better, or for worse, whatever the market does after that. Um, you're going to be in at that pricing. Um, there's float down that happens. There's some other stuff, but we'll chew into that in another episode where we talk about how this lending can be actually super flexible compared to other financing products. You know, I can't pay extra when I get my car loan to get a lower interest rate. You can right. when you buy a house, right. um, or you can do the opposite to generate credit to pay for closing costs that you otherwise maybe can't afford or don't want to pay. So right. um, lots of flexibility there, but let's assume you're locked in, you're square. We know what the closing costs are. We're subtracting the seller credit from that. We know what your down payment is. You've already got your earnest money in there. So right. there's going to be a final balancing between your lender and the title company as they confirm and whittle down, you know, daily interest and state and government recording fees and all the right. little sub costs that add up Taxes, to that multi-thousand dollar closing cost. Right. All those um, things. And then they're going to say, hey, this is the remainder. This is what's left over after we subtract the earnest money that you've already put in. That's what we want you to wire to title typically. Um, uh, some people will do it as a cashier's check. It can't be a personal check though. Uh, at right. least not, not in Oregon. Right. And then at that point, um, you're settled to close. You go in, you sign all of the documents. Uh, we won't go into the hundred pages that you have to sign. Mm -hmm. um, but on the lending side, uh, that's where a lot of that comes from. But it's also, uh, you know, your title and um, different disclosures and, you know, a number of different things. And then at that point, uh, it goes to uh, title or and escrow will, will basically pay off um, previous loans. Um, they will transfer title over, make sure everything, yeah. everybody gets paid. They'll take in all those funds and then exactly. they will distribute Disperse them to out. each person. Exactly. Who and needs then, to get paid? The usually, seller, their loan holder. Sometime mid afternoon, mm -hmm. um, if everything was done in the morning of that business day, uh, then you'll get the call that you actually have been recorded with the county and yeah. you now have title of that property. And uh, that's and that's the end of the process. Now I, I would argue that normally that's a two day process. I would I would say that the 
the typical, uh, unless you're really like back up against the ropes, they're going to try to do the signing with you the day before you fund. Absolutely. So Absolutely. they're signing where you're, you're signing off what you're going to do. And especially if it's the day before, there's a lot more flexibility. Um, right. They can often do a mobile notary for a fee. Um, they'll come meet you at your house, your job, whatever it is, coffee mm-hmm. shop. Um, and, uh, and then they'll start the process of sending money all over, including yours, your wire that's coming in. Um, And then the next day, all of those wires clear and that's considered funding when the, when the money comes from your bank specifically, that's, that's Mm -hmm. a funded loan at that point. Um, And then there's recording as, as Rob mentioned. So the County is actually going to record and say officially, yes, that's when, you know, ink hits the paper and you are in the public record as the owner of that property. Right. And that's, probably one of the most that's truly keys in hand at that point in theory mentally at least you know there's nothing that can stop the transaction at that point you own that house and then rob well and then the party starts right yeah um and when i say the party starts is uh (laughs) hey guess what you own another house and uh or one less house depending on which side you're on Mm -hmm. and (laughs) uh and then uh the the real work starts which is everybody's gonna move right yes Um, whole whole nother conversation and fortunately and then you hire movers Yes, absolutely. Just yeah. hire movers. That's just, like the yeah. greatest. All my years in this industry, my biggest piece of advice is please just hire movers. Just it's hire not movers. worth it. Um, you only got one back. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, um, and, you know, and you'll drop and break one thing and go up. Oh, that was that's the movers right there. I yeah. could have had just like one less thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's something so anyway, we all so kind of have to learn, but. So and, but that's you've got a, a lot of life to unpack. Um, exactly. Movers become more and more valuable. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a fun process. We love it. There's, uh, yeah. uh, we, we've dug into a lot of the nitty gritty. There's so many other details in the process and so many uh, left field items, but uh, hopefully this little three-part series will, will kind of walk you through what to expect to a certain degree and then, uh, you know, rely on your professionals. Uh, yeah. they will create yeah. the wins for you. That's so. one of the hardest things about recording this with you, Rob, is, is, uh, you and I both, I think it's, it's hard not to, to go down, um, all these little pathways because we've just sure. seen so much. And like I said, the FHA handbooks, a thousand pages right there. Oh, That's geez. a thousand pages of rules just for one of, you know, a dozen t- different loan types. Um, realistically, there's lots of stuff that we're not going to be able to cover here. And that's why it's important at the beginning of this process to really be strict about how you hire um, the professionals for this. Um, And I say hire, I mean, you know, your buyer, your agent as a buyer gets paid out of the seller's pocket in theory. Mm -hmm. Um, But you're responsible for them getting paid, you are the client. Um, And and, and they don't get paid unless it closes. So um, the system is, is, you know, um, it's got its pros and cons, but I feel like it's designed in such a way that the reward is there on purpose at the end. Um, we're all in it to win it. We don't get paid anything right. for all that time we've invested unless we get you to the end of the transaction. So it's right. us. It's in our best interest to make sure um, that you are going to get the loan, um, that right. the house is up to snuff, um, that you are offering a fair price, uh, that you are not going to have an appraisal shortfall. Um, these are all the kind of considerations that are just normal day to day for us. But um, you know, take experience sure. to, to know. I could never teach, I couldn't just sit someone down and teach them everything that I know. I, right. I don't, I don't even know all the things that I know. They only, they're, they're situational as they come up. I, I know, or I know who to go to, um, to find the right answers. So, um, yeah. try to grab someone with some experience. I don't want to shoot these guys in the foot who are out here, you know, fresh face trying to get it, but, um, I've seen it out there. I've seen people trust their family members who, you know, are real green. Um, and it's, uh, you can be lucky. You can have a simple process. You can have no sure. appraisal shortfall. Um, and then it'll seem like they did a really great job. But um, a lot of the times, those of us who do this for a, a living, um, we know that, yeah, there's, there's a degree of knowledge that has to be there. And if you're really good at it, it won't seem like you did anything because right. you're going to make it look easy because you, right. you're not scrambling every time something abnormal happens. Right. We'll look at it as opportunities. Um, and the, the biggest thing that we have to remember, uh, we do this every day to make a living. And uh, it, it oftentimes becomes, you know, oh, hey, I've dealt with that before. Uh, and here's how we're going to deal with it. Uh, every once in a while, there's a left field thing. And it's like, okay, we've got to figure out how to deal with it. And our core values will dictate how we do that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, uh, we always have to remember is every single close 
for that client. It's for, it, it is a life change intersection for them. Yeah. And that's yeah. the piece is for us. Oh, okay. It was run of the mill. We did great. You know, there's multiple hinge points. We provided tons of value. Um, you know, we were creating everyday millionaires every day. Right. But uh, in the real estate realm, but uh, you know, huge, huge pivot points for them, huge value. And uh, you know, that's, that's what we're here to provide. So um, yeah, love it. Yeah. It can uh, be tough. It can be, one. I mean, we get emotionally yeah. invested. I've, Oh yeah. It happens. Years have been shed for clients. It's, it's tough. It's a, uh, it's a gripping thing, but um, it's also one of the most rewarding things about oh. my career. I mean, is, is we get to um, help people move to that next echelon and revisiting yeah. with them at the five, 10, 20 year mark after you've worked with someone, um, not me, but Rob, I know you've got some clients that you've worked yeah. with for literally decades at this point. Um, it's a, uh, it's a meaningful thing. Cause you really get yeah. to see um, it's called the get rich Re slow podcast. <laughs> for uh, we want to help reason. you guys build wealth <laughs> exactly. and um, real estate is part of, of, I don't, I can't think of a single person, you know, who we've talked to about these kind of things, the financial aspect who that's not part of their portfolio. You get to borrow money, um, to buy an appreciating asset. That's as good as it gets. So, um, get yourself in front of it, get yourself a team, follow all these extra steps. Don't skimp out on something like an inspection, um, or shopping around a little bit, taking your time to make sure you find a professional interviewing people, making sure that you vibe. Um, I almost think it's better to, you know, I, I would say that having a connection with your real estate agent might be more valuable in some ways than experience in, in a lot of ways, because you've got to be able to have honest conversations with these people. Um, right. And just don't be afraid to ask these questions. This is right. way too important of a transaction to go, ah, I'm nervous. I don't want to upset somebody. Um, right. Make the phone call, find out what's yes. going on. Talk to your professionals. Exactly. Um, our job is, is in my opinion, maybe even more to educate than to, yes. to know. So um, yeah. yeah. Love it. I hope well, you enjoy this you. little three-parter. Yep. Um, this was a fun one. Yeah. We'll catch you guys out there next time on the Get Rich Slow podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good week out there. Thank you all.